it should be on. Okay. You can put it in your pocket yep. somewhere. I was just going to say about the boards. Yep. One of the, there's a moving board and a moving board, and then one of the students was actually asking Ken not to use the stationary board. Okay. Why don't we try to do that? That way with the two moving ones, yeah, you can, see you both can of always them. see everything. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, and the very bottom, it's hard to see from the back. Okay. So if you're right on the bottom of the board, just move it up a little. Great. Oh, I'll start. Great. Okay. Oh, it's wet. Why is it wet? Oh, we wash it. Oh, okay, that's that's yeah. right. <laughs> as long as it's clean water, that's good. <laughs> Bar yaktar. Yep. Okay. Are you ready to go? Yep. All right, let's get started. So we're very happy to have Masha Baryaktar who's going to be talking to us about dark matter. So Masha, take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to the organizers. It's um, really fun to be back. I was here a while ago. Um, and just walking through campus brings back nice memories. I feel like a student again. So it's great. Um, so today, um, I will be. For, for the next three days, I'll be telling you about uh, dark matter. Um, and this will be somewhat unusual uh, in the series of lectures. So I was asked by the organizers to lecture about dark matter theory and possible detection opportunities, which are really, it's a really important topic in the field uh, today. And this is a um, huge and exciting direction. And for example, in uh, last year's Tazi, which was more focused on uh, particle physics, I looked it up, and there were about one third of the lectures were directly on dark matter, and another one third were kind of tangentially related to dark matter. Uh, whereas here, I'm doing the job of all of the dark matter. So of course, that uh, introduces some interesting choices. Uh, and um, indeed, it's important uh, because dark matter is really one of the leading directions right now in particle theory. Uh, for good reason, it's uh, direct evidence of new physics beyond the standard model. Um, we know it's there. We know a lot about its large scale uh, structure and effects, and that's something I'll talk about. Uh, we have a lot of excellent ideas for theoretically motivated dark matter candidates, uh, and I'll touch on that as well. And um, there are many interesting techniques to search for it in the lab experiment, um, experimentally and in astrophysical observations. That said, we really have no idea what it is at the microphysical level, and we really know very little about it at anything other than gravitational um, interaction, in anything other than gravitational interactions and uh, very large cosmological scales. Um, so since I have the job of covering all of this in three lectures, uh, I'm going to outline what I hope you will take away from it. But if you have uh, like questions about dark matter that you've been afraid to ask, at colloquia in your department, uh, or in a seminar, or just are interested from something, then feel free to let me know, and I can try to cover it in the following lectures uh, as well. So the goal of this is to uh, convince you there's strong evidence uh, for cold dark matter and the relevant, uh, go over the relevant cosmological and astrophysical constraints uh, briefly, uh, describe some key dark matter possibilities and how to evaluate dark matter models. So if you Talk to your friends who are building dark matter models. You know what questions to ask. Uh, and talk about current and future efforts in the search uh, for dark matter. So feel free to ask questions and let me know uh, which aspects you're interested in. So the outline for the three lectures will be day one, just today. Um, I'll talk about. Uh, what we know about dark matter. Uh, so this is mostly we'll talk about evidence um, and also a bit about cosmological constraints. Uh, tomorrow, we'll uh, talk about uh, what uh, dark matter might be. So this is um, kind of well-motivated dark matter candidates. Uh, 
which includes uh, currently excluded ones like neutrinos, um, axions, and WIMPs. And we'll generalize it to um, more general classes. of models and their production. And then uh, that might take us a bit into day three. And for the rest of day three, um, we'll talk about uh, these models. Um, so how we learn more about dark Um, so, uh, experiments um, and observations, and this will be, you know, necessarily model dependent uh, uh, directions. Okay, sounds good. Great. Um, so uh, also, yeah, as I said, this is a huge topic, and I'll only be covering small uh, chunks of it to give you a flavor. So I'll try to provide references in the notes that I'll post eventually um, to where you can learn more about each of the different uh, topics. And also feel free uh, to ask questions or come chat with me. So what do we know about dark matter? Uh, hundred percent of what we know comes from astrophysical and cosmological observations. Uh, and I'll try to be clear about distinguishing what we've established experimentally and what are kind of reasonable extrapolations or theoretical uh, models. So first, um, historically, of course, you've probably heard the spiel, dark matter was first detected um, in galactic rotation curves where there was missing mass that was necessary to explain uh, the motion of stars around, the sun, around uh, galaxies. So you look at the velocity of stars from, uh, as a function of radius in some galaxy uh, outside of our own. And if you calculate just from Newton's laws, uh, the gravitational potential mass inside the sphere of radius r uh, here, you can calculate the corresponding velocity uh, orbiting that mass. And you, tra you trace out this curve. So this is uh, due to visible matter. But of course, uh, as we uh, all know, uh, this is not the end of the story. So here, uh, when you actually look at the velocities of at the measured velocities of galaxies, do we have several colors? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right here. OK, great. Uh, oh, here's blue here. Uh, so if we look at measured velocities, they um, look quite different, especially at large radii. So it looks like there's a mismatch in the amount of gravitational uh, potential energy that's leading to these, men uh, to these measurements being inconsistent with uh, what you predict for, uh, due to the gravitation of just the visible matter. And so um, historically, this was the first evidence, uh, as far as I know, for dark matter. Um, and it's still here, and it's nice and very consistent. Uh, but it's a bit messy. You have to understand galaxies and know what you're measuring. Um, so I thought we would talk ahistorically and discuss um, dark matter in the early universe and the evolution of our universe as we understand it today, which is theoretically really very simple, although of course there's many complications that arise when you actually try to do the measurements. Um, so we'll start with uh, some 101 cosmology uh, just to establish our uh, basics. So first, we're going to understand the evolution of the universe. 
and the need for dark matter. And we'll see that aside from the evidence for dark matter today around in galaxies that we observe um, around us at this time, uh, the evidence for dark matter uh, extends very far back in the history of our universe, uh, which makes it uh, so compelling. So, um, so the evolution of our universe in uh, GR is described by the Friedman Robertson Walker metric and three plus one dimensions, which is where we all live. So the general solution is given by time component plus a scale factor on spatial slices. where there could be a, a non-trivial curvature to this space. So these are called um, co-moving coordinates. And this R squared of T is called the scale factor. Um, and by rescaling the radial coordinates, we can rewrite this um, so that the uh, k term here takes on uh, three discrete values, uh, which correspond to open, closed, and flat universes. Um, so rescale r coordinate. to get a more compact expression. Or this function sk of r on angular coordinates, where sk is of r depends on the sine of k and is sin of r for k equals plus 1. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to jam it in here so that it's all on one board. r or cinch r. Let me know if you can't see if it's too small. k equals 0 or k equals minus 1. Um, you might have seen this in your uh, GR class at some point. Um, so currently, the observational evidence that we have is consistent with the curvature of our space time being zero. So I'll focus on this case from now on, although it's easy uh, to add back in as an additional parameter. So it's not, um, doesn't have to be absolutely zero, but the energy density in curvature seems to be subdominant to other energy densities uh, to the extent that we haven't detected it. Um, so along constant spatial slices, um, time is defined by time coordinate t. So proper time in these coordinates is just uh, t. And proper distance. is r of t times r, where r is the scale factor uh, for a long um, constant time and angular slices. So this means that proper distances get stretched out as the universe uh, is expanding. Uh, and we can define just a couple uh, extra definitions. So we can define dimensionless scale factor A of t. So here, up there, R had dimensions of um, distance. And we can, capital R had dimensions of distance, and little r was dimensionless. Um, as you could perhaps infer that it was in the arguments of functions. Um, so A of t we can define as R of t over R of t naught 
where T naught means uh, time today. And uh, we can also define um, the Hubble parameter which characterizes the expansion of the universe which is the rate of change of the scale factor over the scale factor. And today we measure um, H naught, so H evaluated at the present time to be 70, approximately 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is kind of weird units, um, but this is because it's telling us how fast um, the rate of galaxies which are further away at distance d are moving away from us. So velocity of a galaxy in kilometers per second will be given by h naught times its distance in megaparsecs uh, if it's in the Hubble flow. Um, good, and there's some, um, so I'm putting a squiggle here because there are a couple of measurements of, well, quite a few measurements now of this value. Some very precise ones come from the cosmic microwave background that we'll discuss a bit uh, today. Um, and they're in slight disagreement uh, with um, other ways of establishing this expansion rate, um, which could be interesting. It could be um, a passing uh, lack of understanding of experimental uncertainties. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm giving a squiggle, but the error on this, even if you take um, the disagreements between different measurements into account, is uh, quite small. It's less than uh, a few percent. Okay, and then a uh, final definition for now. We can also define the redshift, which is an important observational quantity because um, we are really bad at measuring distances to things. Um, if they're far away, uh, there's not really a good way to do it. But we're very good at measuring redshifts because we know frequencies of various for example, atomic transitions. So if you know that something today has a particular frequency and you measure that same transition a uh, very long time ago, very far away, you can tell exactly what the redshift is. And we're very good at measuring frequency. So the redshift uh, is related to the scale factor as one is defined as one plus z, which is equal to the frequency of the emitted light over the frequency of the observed light, which is given by uh, the scale factor at observation divided by the scale factor at emission. So there's a relationship between the redshift z, which is what's scaling uh, the frequencies, and the uh, expansion rate of the universe, which makes sense intuitively. I mean, you can calculate this from the metric, but um, it also makes sense intuitively because the physical wavelength is just getting stretched as the scale factor is increasing. Uh, interesting fact is that it seems like the universe has always been expanding, driven by energy density of various sorts. And so that's where we'll go uh, next. So to write down the dynamics, um, of the expansion of our universe, uh, we have to do some dynamical equations, namely Einstein's equations. Um, and we can assume some energy density, um, some properties of the, um, energy that's populating our universe. So um, Einstein's equations by the way I'm going kind of quick because um, 
this is um, kind of general cosmology review, but feel free to interrupt uh, if you have questions. Um, so Einstein's equations uh, give us relationship between the curvature of space-time and its uh, energy density through Newton's constant. So for our purposes, uh, it will be sufficient to describe uh, the stress energy tensor at leading order as uh, made up of um, roughly homogeneous and isotropic uh, perfect fluid. And we'll introduce corrections to that later. So it's given by, it's described by two quantities, the pressure and the density. Uh, pressure P, density rho. Apologies if you can't tell the difference between my P's and my rho's. Um, U, 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 nu. So um, this is explicitly, this is just rho P, P, P. Where P is the isotropic pressure, rho is the energy density, and the U's are uh, velocity vectors uh, for the isotropic fluid um, in the co-moving frame. So U is one zero zero zero. So velocity in um, good. Uh, we can also uh, so we need a bit more uh, to actually solve the equations. So. <clears throat> Uh, where, remember, I'm assuming no curvature. Um, in principle, you can easily add it back as an extra component of the energy density. Um, you have to be a bit careful about your distance measures uh, if you have curvature, but um, that's fine. And we also, uh, right, and we also have the conservation of the stress energy tensor, d mu, d mu nu is zero. So using these equations, we can derive um, Friedman's equations, which I won't you out, but it's a good exercise if you want to remember your GR. So the zero, zero component uh, of this equation um, gives a relationship between the scale factor and the energy density. So h squared is equal to 8 pi g newton over 3 times the energy density, where h is the Hubble uh, constant that I defined, the Hubble parameter uh, that I defined on the right-hand side. Um, the ij components give you another relation, h dot plus h squared equals 4 pi g over 3 rho plus 3p. And the energy conservation uh, um, equation gives you that rho dot changes as minus 3h rho plus p. Um, so these ones are called Friedman's equations. And 
Um, basically, for the background evolution, um, this first one is very useful, and it's easy to estimate whatever you want in terms of um, if you remember this equation. So if you have some particular type of energy density that you know redshifts in a specific way, you can tell what the evolution um, of the scale factor will be. And this is also suppressed by G Newton, so um, which is 1 over M Planck squared, which is a high scale. So in general, um, the Hubble parameter will be a relatively small scale and the problem relative to the other energies, unless you're at uh, very, very high densities close to the Planck scale. Um, okay, so now we need to one more thing, which is the perfect fluid assumption. Which is just saying that the pressure and the density are related. Linearly, uh, through this parameter W. Um, and then we can solve how energy density scales as a function of scale factor by plugging uh, into the energy conservation equation in the first treatment equation. So we get dividing this through by rho, we find that rho dot over rho is equal to minus 3 a dot over a, plugging in for Hubble as is a dot over a, 1 plus w. So if we have constant, um, you can directly integrate this equation and find how the energy density scales for different equations of state, so different values of w as a function of the scale factor. So I'll start a little table over here. Oh, I forgot I had these boards too. Great. Um, so we'll be interested in a few different epochs of our universe. Um, radiation domination, matter domination, and dark energy or cosmological constant, which seems to be the different periods that we observe. So the equation of state for radiation is one third. So the pressure is one third of the energy density in three dimensions. Uh, you can think of um, for radiation is relativistic and uh, the pressure so the momentum and the energy are equal, but the momentum can be split between three different uh, spatial directions. Matter is non-relativistic and exerts no pressure. We can assume it has zero velocity. So this, will, this is what we'll mean by cold dark matter is that the pressure is zero for any energy density. Uh, and dark matter uh, is a slightly weird one. Uh, sorry, dark energy uh, has equation of state uh, W equals minus one. Uh, these give you expressions for energy density as a function of scale factor that make intuitive sense. Um, so for matter, if you plug in zero to that equation on the very left-hand board, you get that rho scales as one over a cubed. So you just think of matter particles, each with some mass, um, getting stretched out with a scale factor, so the energy density dilutes as the volume of the universe. For radiation, you have one over a to the fourth. Um, so you have the same property of particles, particle number density being diluted, but also, as we discussed, the frequency of each uh, radiation particle will also be redshifted, so that gives us another factor of a. So the energy is also decreasing as the universe expands. Uh, for dark energy, um, the energy density is constant. This is just the cosmological constant or the, or the energy density of uh, the vacuum. Okay. Any questions so far? So, yes. Um, You mean physically? 
Um, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, what's the intuition for uh, equation of state of minus energy density? Um, I don't have good intuition off the top of my head. If I think of it, I'll get back to you. Um, good. Other questions? Yes. Yes, excellent. That's exactly where we're going. Oh, sorry. The question was if there, if Hubble is time dependent and how we know observationally what the time dependence is. Yeah, great. So. Um, yes. Yes. That's right. So I, I, I was trying to think of if there's a way to think about like how it's pushing or on, on surrounding um, parts of space, and I don't know how to think of it that way. But yeah, if you just write it down, then you get the, the, right, uh, the right expression on the right-hand side of Einstein's equations for, for vacuum energy. Thank you. Um, good. So the next step is uh, exactly to your question, which is, um, we're going to calculate A and Hubble for these different periods, and then try to understand how our universe looks as a function of time um, from, from the very beginning. So uh, given now that we have row of A in the second column, we can integrate Friedman's equations. So that first equation there, if we, um, so, so next step is we want to find A of t and H of t for different Um, equations of state. So given row of A, um, we have the equation relating H squared, which is A dot over A to rho. Um, so we can rearrange it and integrate it. dA over A, 1 over square root of uh, the energy density as a function of time, which is equal to, I can express it as a combination of these different energy densities. And uh, today, and the scale factors, So rho um, radiation today over A to the fourth plus rho matter. So zero will always refer to today. Rho matter today over A cubed plus rho lambda today, which does not evolve over time. <clears throat> So in general, um, this is hard to integrate. But if one of these three components dominates, then it's trivial. So we can do that for each case. Um, Uh, 
Uh, so, so far, I haven't assumed, I mean, I've assumed that the, the, the total energy density is made up of some linear combination of matter, radiation, and um, uh, dark energy. And just rewritten uh, Friedman's equation. Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, the sum of all of the, the question was if the sum satisfies the Friedman equation. So there is the total energy density, and here I've just rewritten it with our knowledge of how the energy density scales with each type of energy density scales with scale factor um, to, so that we can do this integral explicitly. Are there other types? Uh, yes, good question. Um, are there other types of energy? Um, so as I kind of briefly alluded to, if there is, uh, if there is curvature um, that is uh, non-negligible, you can add it in here, and it acts as a kind of energy density that dilutes as A squared. So we could add rho, uh, let's call it K, over A squared. So this is, as we'll see, um, the slower something dilutes with scale factor, the more it comes to dominate today. So um, it's not too hard to see that we would see curvature if it were there in, in some significant amount because it scales slower than both matter and radiation. Um, there are other types of, I mean, you can write down arbitrary potentials for scalar fields that can give you different equations of state. There are some constraints um, from GR on um, which, which things give you consistent uh, evolution. Um, but you can have faster, faster redshifting, for example, a kinetically dominated scalar field, like something mu phi um, will scale away as a to the six. Um, I don't have any examples for linear and A. If anyone can think of it, let me know. But the kind of physically motivated ones are uh, matter and radiation. Yes? If, if like the radiation and matter interacts, is it true that we will have like the sum of the rho A as you have there? Um, good question. Uh, it depends. Yeah, so, so this is a simplified assumption where you just have um, a particular equation um, of, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. So if, if there is interacting uh, matter and uh, radiation, you can have different scalings that interpolate between the two. Typically in our universe, we'll have um, either they're in um, tight equilibrium and have and are all very hot, so everything is just scaling like radiation. This is true very early in our universe. Um, or you can have uh, things redshifting separately. Um, there's Let me, like, let me get back to you later when we talk a bit more about this in detail. But yeah, in principle, you could have, um, you can have things uh, being regenerated through thermal processes, for example. But if you have a particle that's um, very heavy, it'll just redshift away. Um, and that those thermal processes will not be efficient at recreating it. Good question. Other questions? OK. So now if we focus on one term at a time, we can do this integral. It's uh, just a power law. So this gives us for uh, radiation, A is um, gives you T to the time to the 1 half. 
So I'm assuming all of the all of the zero subscript things are constants that are measured today, for example. For matter, this gives us t to the two thirds uh, from the three halves power of a there, and for um, for dark energy, of course, um, it's you get an exponential, which will be given by some constant, which is Hubble, the Hubble rate uh, times time. And uh, then you can just plug this in for the definition of Hubble, which is a dot over a. And you find that in radiation, Hubble scales like 1 over uh, time. Hubble always scales like 1 over time for matter and radiation with a factor of 1 half and 2 thirds. And for dark energy, uh, it's a constant. Oops. Good. So then now we can answer a question of how our universe looked as a function of time for a given set of matter content. So let's plot the evolution of the universe as we understand it today as a function of uh, the redshift or this inverse scale factor. This is a log log plot. Um, is it about the same? And we can plot the log of the energy density. Um, so this is time is going to the left here to be consistent with future plots that I'll be drawing. So today time equals zero is here. At some early time, we'll call uh, T reheating is here. We also have some other scales that we understand, which is T recombination. T equality and T BBN, which I'll define in a second. So as far as we can tell today, we're entering a period of dark energy domination. So the energy density is going to trending to be constant with time. Of course, we don't know what will happen in the future. So let me make this a dashed line. Um, between today and T quality, so this is matter radiation equality, we understand quite well what was happening, which is that uh, this was an era of matter domination. Where rho was scaling as a to the minus 3, as we have up there. Um, in terms of actual time, uh, and I apologize if this is confusing because I'm using like three different uh, ways of measuring time, which are kind of all interchangeable in cosmology. But if you don't think about it all the time, it's probably confusing. Um, so uh, I'll also label, I'll put both the times and the redshifts here. So this is time uh, today, which is about uh, 13.8 billion years um, after the Big Bang. Uh, recombination is about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. 
uh, TBBN is about three minutes. In uh, redshift, this equals zero. Z equals 1100. T quality is Z equals 3400. And TBBN is about Z equals 10 to the 10. T reheating, which is when we think the universe entered um, a hot bang, big bang type state. Um, after inflation, we have no idea, but we know it was before TBBN because we have measurements from that period of time. Uh, it is uh, log one plus z, but yes. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, so after. T equality, here we have uh, matter and radiation uh, in equal amounts, which we know from the cosmic microwave background, which I will hopefully get to um, in the last half an hour. Um, and so we're dominated by radiation, which still exists today, but is diluting faster. Um, so today it's a subdominant component. And we know that at BBN, when light elements were formed in our universe, the temperature was a few mega electron volts, and um, we were in radiation domination. We know there were uh, many more photons and baryons. Um, we don't really know what happened before BBN. Uh, the simplest is to extrapolate radiation domination all the way back toward a period of uh, inflation, which we have very good evidence for. Um, but we don't know exactly how it ended. And inflation, it's an earlier period of dark energy domination at some other scale. Uh, but we don't know exactly where it is on the x-axis or when it ends on the time axis, and in principle, if you're far enough back from BBN, which is the earliest time we have experimental evidence for, uh, as to not mess up the measurements around here, this thing could be doing all kinds of crazy stuff uh, that we don't know. So maybe there was an earlier period of matter domination, maybe there was something else, uh, but the simplest story is to just extend radi radiation domination all the way to the exit from inflation dumped a bunch of energy into a hot thermal bath of all of the degrees of freedom that are accessible at, at, a, at that temperature. <clears throat> um, good. Any questions on this? So I was going to talk a little bit about um, motivation for, for the inflationary universe. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, I will um, just remind you of the usual arguments of horizon and flatness problems um, that our universe um, and um, that were original motivation, as well as the extreme homogeneity of the cosmic microwave background. So I should define what, what these times are again. So equality is uh, just defined by when rho matter is equal to rho radiation. Um, so it's not, it's a scale that's a function of kind of the, inner, the components of our universe. Recombination is when the universe became cool enough um, for uh, hydrogen to be neutral without constantly being ionized. Um, and uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, as I mentioned, is when the universe became cool enough for um, light elements to start forming out of protons and neutrons. So these are set by 
the temperature of the universe at these times, as well as by the relative abundance of photons and um, baryons, as they're called in cosmology, which is everything that is not a photon or dark matter. <clears throat> so let me say a few words about the temperature, and then we'll talk about uh, perturbations. <clears throat> so the temperature um, of a gas or um, a bath of particles and thermal equilibrium is described by um, uh, Fermi or Bose statistics and the distribution, so temperature. The distribution as a function of momentum is given, as you recall from Statmec, uh, by the energy at some temperature, plus or minus one, depending on if it's a fermion or a boson, uh, where the energy is square root of p squared plus m squared. And so the number density of particles is given by G, which counts a weighted number of degrees of freedom, so it's some order one number, times D3P over 2 pi cubed, so the phase space integral of this quantity. So this goes like T cubed for relativistic degrees of freedom, and MT to the 3 halves e to the minus m over t for m less than or equal to the temperature because of this suppression. So overall, the, um, the energy density of um, different states will redshift as uh, described, but the, the temperature and its particular relation to the energy density and the number density. So the number density, of course, the energy density will be the energy times the number density uh, will depend on whether you're in equilibrium uh, or uh, if there are different species which are talking to each other. So this is where it becomes important to think about uh, the question of whether radiation and matter is coupled or, or not coupled. Um, good. So to add some extra scales on here, BBN is around capital MEV, and recombination is around 0.2 EV, which comes from the fact, uh, so recombination, is when um, you have protons plus electrons going to neutral hydrogen, not to be confused with the Hubble parameter, plus photons. Uh, it turns out that we have many more photons in our universe than protons and electrons. Um, and so this process is biased to go quite a bit later than when, is, um, when this first becomes energetically favorable, just because there's a long tail of high energy photons. So this happens, so typically the transition, the binding energy of hydrogen, right, as you might remember from your quantum mechanics class or chemistry class is 13.6 EV, but the ratio of photons um, to baryons is about 10 to the 10. So the actual energy at which recombination happens is about uh, log 1 over log 10 to the 10, 13.6 EV, which is what is observed as 
0.2 electron volts. And that continues to redshift until today, until the famous CMB temperature, which is 2.73 Kelvin. <clears throat> Um, so, what do I want to say here? So there's a few things that, that we know very well. One is um, I, we can calculate different processes that happen um, at MeV energy scales. And assuming everything is in thermal equilibrium, that matches very well the element dependencies that we observe uh, today. So we know that our theory of everything being in radiation domination and in equilibrium holds at BBN times. So the Hubble parameter is indeed scaling as the radiation uh, domination scale. Um, we also measure um, the photons that were emitted from the CMB. And You've all uh, seen these uh, maps of temperature fluctuations from the sky that were released at that time. And these are photons that were in constant contact with um, electrons and protons uh, and are now freely streaming to us today. And so they tell us very precisely what the universe looked at, like at that time. Um, and so what we know is that the temperature fluctuations at uh, T recombination were of order 5 times 10 to the minus 5 um, of the average. So the universe was extremely uh, nice and uniform. Um, early on, and this is very nice for us because we can calculate things. Um, so basically, the evolution is this tells us that. So I've been telling you all the story about you know background evolution of the energy density and the pressure, uh, and just assuming that they're described by a single number, um, and that's a big assumption, especially uh, like here in this room. That is really not the case. We have order one fluctuations in the energy density between where I'm standing and right here. Uh, but in, uh, in the early universe, it's an extremely good uh, approximation, which allows us to do uh, perturbation theory around these fluctuations. Um, so if we do uh, the same analysis of um, the Friedman equations, or not the Friedman equations, uh, of the Friedman equations to, to next order um, in perturbations, we can define, um, so uh, well described by background solution. So beyond uh, background evolution, We can introduce uh, perturbations. So our energy density will be described by some average energy density plus a perturbation. Similarly, for the pressure and the temperature. And we can work in terms of um, these um, small quantities. We can expand in terms of these small quantities. Um, now, today, um, these are no longer small uh, because we know there's structure in our universe where uh, different regions of our universe, like galaxies, have orders of magnitude more energy density than um, the space around them. Uh, so at some point, uh, this expansion becomes a bad approximation. So early on, d rho over rho is much less than 1. And then uh, due to um, gravitational 
collapse, over densities grow, and delta rho over rho becomes order one, which um, now you have a nonlinear evolution, which you can no longer treat analytically, um, and usually have to put on a computer to do uh, n body simulations of uh, structure formation, although there are some interesting uh, techniques. Um, borrowing from effective field theory uh, that can kind of push this approximation to slightly bigger values um, or closer closer to the nonlinear re regime. <clears throat> so the question that I want to come back to you is uh, how do we know we have uh, dark matter? That was the original point of this exercise. Um, so I've been telling you about how different types of energy density scale, right? And we know we have, um, we know we have this particular evolution of the universe, but uh, we already have a bunch of matter around us in terms of protons and electrons. Um, and different uh, elements today. Um, so why do we need an extra um, contribution in the form of dark matter? So uh, early on, um, so during, um, so, sorry, I'm going a bit quickly here in the interest of time. Uh, so during uh, CMB time, where we have uh, temperatures above this few this few tenths of NeV scale, uh, protons, electrons, and photons are uh, tightly coupled, so that means that um, their scattering rate is very fast compared to the other time scales um, in the universe, such as the expansion rate. Um, so the overall um, fluctuations in the baryons where I'll define delta x as dx over x average. So the fluctuations in the energy density of baryons uh, rho x um, is has to be of the same order as the fluctuations and the energy density of photons, which, based on um, thermodynamics, is also the same as the fluctuations and the temperature, which I've told you from observations of the CMB is uh, about five times 10 to the minus five. So in these, um, so that tells you that the um, perturbations in the baryons, which are the protons and the electrons, is um, quite small. And this is at redshift 1100 when they decouple. Um, but we know today Delta matter, whatever it is, has to be order one um, much earlier, let me say, than today. So galaxies started forming not yesterday, but many billions of years ago. So that means that structure had to become nonlinear early on. So we have to grow our perturbations from 10 to the minus 5 to order 1 within uh, basically three orders of magnitude in redshift. So we can ask, how do per perturbations grow uh, in this expanding universe? So we've talked about how uh, energy uh, redshifts, but we can also talk about how perturbations in the energy uh, redshift. So let me erase this. So if you plug in um, 
these perturbations into Einstein's equations, you also need to um, keep track of perturbations in the metric at the same order. So I'll make some assumptions here. Uh, so in a matter dominated universe, Um, and at small scales, which means that the momentum of your perturbation, the wave vector, uh, is high compared to the size of the horizon. So this is your observable universe, and we're looking at some small perturbations inside. <clears throat> The matter perturbation, delta rho over rho, evolution equations um, are given by, um, I have some of the intermediate steps in my notes that I'll put up, but I'll just write the final result. Um, plus dm minus three halves h squared dm. So the perturbations um, grow uh, more quickly, um, more or less quickly depending on the expansion rate of the universe. So this is kind of a damped oscillator equation. And we have from the previous Friedman equations, of course, the overall the entry rate of the universe is still dominated by the background density, not the flip perturbations, which are small. Um, so we still have that um, from that table over there. A of t goes like t to the two thirds, and Hubble goes like uh, two over three t. So we can plug that in to this equation for the perturbations to give us that the perturbations grow as uh, 4 over 3t dm dot minus 2 over 3t squared dm. So I just plugged in for Hubble. And um, if we make a power law on that for how the uh, perturbations grow, so I uh, guess dm is time to some power gamma. This gives us two solutions. This is a quadratic equation for gamma. Uh, and we get gamma equals uh, minus 1 and 2 thirds, uh, which converting it back, so in terms of the time evolution, so converting it back to scale factor tells us that the matter uh, perturbations as a function of time grow as uh, the scale factor times some initial conditions. So there's two solutions. One is growing and one is decaying. Scale factor to the minus 3 halves times some other initial condition, where the initial condition If we had only baryons, which are tightly coupled to photons and no dark matter, uh, these would be of order 10 to the minus 5. Yes? What's capital K? Capital K. Uh, there's only lowercase k, I apologize, and it's the momentum of the mode. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're decomposing. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't introduced the mode decomposition here, but um, we can treat these perturbations in, in momentum space. So at each momentum, you have an independent solution uh, while uh, the perturbations are small. Um, so, so this is telling you that matter perturbations during matter radiation grow linearly with scale factor. 
So that means that if we start uh, them at 5 times 10 to the minus 5, uh, z of 1100, which is scale factor of 10 to the minus 3, approximately. Uh, then today, so if only baryons, then d matter today is 10 to the 3 times 5 times 10 to the minus 5. Which is or which is less than 0.1, but we know that structures became um, started collapsing and became nonlinear much earlier than today. So this is telling us that uh, we need some other type of matter um, that is that can start growing perturbations earlier than at recombination because uh, you need at least another couple orders of magnitude uh, to reach uh, order one uh, inhomogeneities to get the universe that we see today. Um, and so to have this, and to have that be the case, that new type of matter has to behave like matter. So it has to have the same time evolution, background evolution and perturbations uh, in the expanding universe as, um, as matter, as something that scales like a to the minus 3, but also it has to not uh, be interacting strongly with radiation, uh, which keeps it um, in a tightly coupled bath all the way up until recombination and doesn't allow it uh, to clump um, at earlier times. So. That's um, the universe's um, way of telling us that we have dark matter. And this is much more detailed than what I've told you here. So let me give you a sense of, in the last couple of minutes, we can actually calculate and measure um, the power spectrum of these fluctuations as a function of scale, so this momentum k. Well, I'm erasing, are there any questions? Yeah. yeah. Why is it valid to use this equilibrium for different momentum and not to Why is it valid to use equilibrium? Why? Because that's assuming you're in equilibrium. Yes. Correct. Why is it not in equilibrium? The processes that are keeping, uh, the processes that are responsible for recombination are in, are fast enough to keep, to, that process is in equilibrium. So P, the, the recombination process is in equilibrium. There are other things that have gone out of equilibrium. Uh, good question. Um, so, I mean, it depends on what question you're asking. Well, you, you used uh, the Fermian total distribution to calculate the two momentum. Yes, uh, good, right, sorry. So the question is, what are the corrections to, to equilibrium? And the answer is that they are very small. Um, so there are two different corrections. Uh, I erased it, but there are two different types of corrections, and uh, they're both at the level of uh, I'll, I'll double check, but I, I believe that there are a level that have not been measured yet. So this is the famous, um, you know, Kobe thermal spectrum, uh, where the air bars are uh, as a like number as a function of wavelength or whatever, uh, where the air bars are small. So this is a thermal distribution cubed here and falls off exponentially. And um, so we've been looking for deviations away from this. There are two types of corrections called mu, like chemical potential type and y type. 
And both of those are less than at the order of 10 to the minus 5, which is what we've measured so far. And there, are, there were experiments that were planned to look for these, especially because there are signatures of new physics that might show up there first. Uh, but uh, so far, the best that we have from the 90s, and it's, it's below that level. Yeah. Good question. Um, so we're, we're just out of time. OK. Great. So um, so hopefully I've convinced you that there's dark matter. Uh, next time, we'll talk about what else we can learn uh, about the microscopic properties of dark matter. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific uh, examples. I'm happy to take questions. All right. No more questions now. After lunch, you will have 10 part two at 2 o'clock. Great. Do they clean the board? Oh, no, they'll clean Okay, great. I'm used, to, I'm used to having to erase everything after my class. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry, there was still a little bit. Oh, oh, no, no worries. <laughs> it was partly by